Thanks for joining us for another episode of Tea and Trails. I'm Emma Dietrich, one of your hosts. Today I'm joined with Dr. Ed Gonzalez Tennant. Thanks for joining us. And uh, would you like to introduce yourself and your mug? Yeah, hi, I'm Ed uh, Gonzalez Tennant, University of Central Florida. So my mug is a Florida Museum of Natural History mug. Uh, this was actually the first place when I arrived in Florida in 05 as a graduate student at the University of Florida. This is the first place I actually had a job. So that's, that's the meaning of the mug for me. Oh, cheers to that. Uh, my mug today is actually a little bit of vintage wear, and it's a vintage blue willow pattern from the 1920s, which we'll talk a little bit about that when we discuss your research. So our first question right off the bat is, why did you become an archaeologist? Well, um, probably unlike some archaeologists, I never dreamt of being an archaeologist as a child. Uh, that seemed something that was sort of doable to uh, somebody like me growing up uh, in the Ozarks. It just wasn't sort of on my radar. And I went to uh, undergrad at the University of Arkansas. I signed up for a field school. It happened to be historical archaeology field school, industrial archaeology. Um, there was also an African-American component. So um, I spent six weeks one summer digging this up, and it occurred to me that my interest in history um, my interest in sort of African-American history or minority history in general, all of these things um, were something I could explore and do so in a really tangible way um, through the material culture, the artifacts we find. And of course, part of that uh, project was on a state forest, meaning we had the public visiting daily. So I got this wonderful introduction to engaging the past um, tangibly, engaging the public face to face and realizing that this was what archaeology actually was or could be. So my first year as an undergrad, that's when I found out about archaeology. And I was fortunate enough to have people teach me about archaeology that brought all of those interests together. So after that, I was hooked. And that was almost 20 years ago, 2001. All right. So our next question is, in roughly 30 seconds, what is your current research? So um, my current research, I, you know, I sort of wear a couple different hats, but um, I'm, I'm a historical archaeologist really by training. So that means I'm interested in questions that count um, really sort of the last 500 years, but also things like uh, how uh, inequality emerges. So my probably most significant or largest research project is an ongoing one with the community of Rosewood, Florida, which is an African-American community in Levy County that was destroyed in uh, 1923 during a uh, race riot. Um, so a week long episode of violence that resulted in the town's destruction and the violent displacement of the area's black community. And so I look at that um, in a couple different ways, right? So I, I draw on three types of data, uh, already, uh, archeological or artifact data, um, documentary data, and then of course oral history or oral testimony. And so the other part of my research is really kind of digital archaeology, so using computer mapping to bring these data sets together to make them speak to the past, to answer questions about the ongoing difficulty of our country to deal with difference, um, but then also things like 3D modeling, um, virtual world environments to really sort of bring um, that past to life and, and invite the public to uh, experience it in some way. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you still work with a little bit of the descendant community or the folks that are still living within that region. So yeah, there's a there's a large group of interested parties. So there's um, an enormous descendant community. A hundred plus years ago, Rosewood would have had 150, 200 people living in it. Uh, most of those being African American, obviously in the inner city hundred years that community has continued to grow. Uh, some of them live nearby, but most of them live, um, you know, much further away. So some live close by as close as Archer or Gainesville, Florida. Others live like here in Orlando, um, Jacksonville, Florida, all across the state, uh, even in, in other places. So um, I do work with that community as much as I can. Um, and that includes interviewing them, um, some of them are descendants of families who left Rosewood before it was destroyed, so they have access to letters and photographs, so new documentary evidence that we uh, collect and try to integrate into the larger project is uh, 
as best we can or only get the opportunity to. Uh, and then of course, you know, there's all the landowners. None of the descendants live in the area of Rosewood or that portion of Levy County today. Um, they, they, they haven't returned. Um, and in fact, many of the people who live there today weren't there or their families, I should say, weren't there a hundred years either. So there's been a lot of changeover in terms of the people who live there from a hundred years ago to today, but bringing those landowners in, we have to because it's uh, the area where Rosewood existed is all privately owned. So the only way we do any work out there, archeological work is through private landowner permission. And we've been very fortunate. We found many landowners who are, um, who, I mean, graciously share access to their properties with us. And so we continue to do work out there and we're bringing in some of the uh, other communities uh, like Sum uh, Sumner and Cedar Key and their black history uh, into this research as well. So it's a whole mishmash, if you will, of interested parties. Um, and archeology span is really sort of playing a central role in helping to bring those communities together in conversation and uh, a conversation that I'd like to think either, well, it did certainly happen before archeology, span but I'd like to think that archeology span is helping create some new bridges to foster that conversation. Oh yeah, what's a better way to bond than a few days in the field or going out and visiting the site? Uh, and that's kind of a great little segue into our next question that's relating to your field kit. So what is your favorite tool? And if you have it with you, you can show it. If not, it is acceptable. I know we're not all uh, able to access our offices. I have a couple different things. I mean, really, I think, and I don't know, just because it, it's, I think, popular uh, and a lot of people know about it, I, I brought my my UAV or my drone. So there we go. Um, um, so I use, you know, I use that to do low altitude aerial imagery, to do 3D modeling using photogrammetry, you know, taking a series of photos and creating spatially accurate 3D models. So I've used that actually quite a bit in Rosewood and Sumner and Levy County and elsewhere to uh, help us document really the broader context of sites. And, you know, sort of in conjunction with that, this probably doesn't look very exciting, but it's my, um, basically a GPS unit, right? A really fancy GPS unit that when used in conjunction with other, other tools, uh, cell phone, internet, uh, also a state system of GPS receivers, I can actually get in the field like centimeter accuracy. So when I map features, I'm actually giving them real world coordinates to the centimeter, you know, within a few inches of where they actually are on the Earth's surface. So these tools let me do a lot of a lot more work and relate it to the broader world and do all of that faster. So that's that's those are my tools that I've been using a lot lately. Oh no, I love it. And I also love that you brought in the drone because I feel like a lot of people uh, still have this idea of archaeologists going out with your brush and whatnot and doing all of this kind of I guess low key excavation style research, but we're not as tech savvy as uh, we really are. And it's well, and actually using this in Rosewood, we were able to survey larger areas more rapidly. We can pop that into uh, the GIS work with like LIDAR and other remotely sensed data sets. It actually allowed us to find a previously undocumented industrial site in Rosewood that likely corresponds to either a turpentine still, probably a turpentine still, or a sawmill. And these were black owned businesses in Rosewood that um, we knew existed from documentary and oral history records, but placing them on the landscape, it was tools like this that allowed us to first identify it and then go in and do like really good mapping. That's awesome. I'm glad it's uh, working out so well for Rosewood. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, it's really, I mean, and we're, you know, like I said, we're expanding it into other nearby communities. So it's letting us look at, um, we use it to document cemeteries. So we have a low altitude aerial cemetery, or sorry, low altitude imagery for these cemeteries, um, which means that when we, you know, do ground penetrating radar surveys, we document the standing markers, we can tie all of this in and put the, put those results on an, an image, a picture, so that when um, the, the people who manage the cemetery or other locals view our results, they can, they can contextualize that 
they can see that in relation to the other stuff on the ground and it, it, it's more immediately recognizable for them. It's, I mean, it's great. It's a great toolkit, a great addition to our toolkit. Yeah, and it's a great toolkit, like you kind of stressed, that's beneficial to the community, to the public. Well, and everything we did, so, um, you know, we did two cemetery surveys with state funding the last two summers. Um, 300 marked uh, graves, uh, GPR survey revealed probably another 30 plus unmarked graves. And we're putting all of these layers of data together um, in, in sort of a web hosted interface for the, um, the group that um, the board of trustees for that cemetery, because in that portion of Levy County, it's one of the few cemeteries um, that still has room to grow. So it's become, if it's not the, it's become one of the most active cemeteries. And so now we are, we're helping them manage the for future use of that cemetery so that they don't, uh, for instance, gr dig a new grave and hit an old unmarked one, which of course they would prefer to avoid. <laughs> I think most people would avoid, um, yeah. and to avoid that situation. Um, so continuing on and keeping with a little bit of a theme of the field work, uh, what is your best worst field story? So um, I I have probably like a lot of archaeologists, uh, a number of them. I think I'm going to go with um, it's it's got a happy ending, so that's a good thing, right? Um, so I've done I do I've done work in 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 a few different places. Obviously, Florida is where I do most of my work, but I have worked in the Caribbean as well. Um, and I used to run a uh, field project, so field schools every summer on an island, uh, Nevis, so it's part of a two island federation called St. Kitts and Nevis. It's over by Montserrat and that part of the Lesser Antilles. And there's a tree on that island and many Caribbean islands called the Machineal tree. And this is a tree whose sap when mixed with uh, water, like sweat or rain becomes um, acidic or caustic. And so this was probably the third or fourth year in a row that I had two uh, crew chiefs. So these are students, graduate students who'd been working with me for years. They came out. We had to clear a machineal tree from part of the site. We've done this every year. It's, it's common practice on Caribbean sites. But for some reason this year, those two uh, decided to sort of compete with each other on who could cut down the most tree fastest. So I guess their machismo got the better of them. Um, and as they were doing this, you know, everybody, myself, other uh, crew members are like, hey guys, make sure you don't, right, watch the sap. The sap's like milkweed sap, it's bright white, it's hard to miss. And, um, and then you see them eventually like rubbing their faces, wiping sweat, they've got the sap all over them. Um, so long story short is one of them gets it in uh, their eyes, in his eyes quite a bit, to the point where we have to take him to the hospital, which it's a small island, but great medical care. I became very uh, familiar with that hospital over a few years with one repeat student slash crew chief in particular, cutting fingers open and all sorts of fun stuff. But um, great hospital. Take him there. Uh, they, they flush his eyes. They give us some medicine. Take him back. And basically, he, he loses his sight for about four days. So um, the, the happy ending is he recovered. <laughs> he got his sight back. The funny aspect, I hope he remembers it this way as well, is he had brought a lot of comic books with him to the island to read over that the course of the month or so we would be there. Uh, they happened to basically all be Daredevil comics. So while he was blinded, members of the crew read and described each panel to him of Daredevil comics for about oh, four days, almost four days. So that's my best worst story, I think. Um, he should have known better, uh, but there you go. <laughs> I do like the irony of the Daredevil comics. It's pretty fantastic. Yeah, you can't make this up. <laughs> so our technically last, well, second to last question, last formal question of our little interview is a big one, but it's how do you think that archaeology can save the world? Oh, well, uh, this is something that I think about from uh, time to time, um, actually probably quite often. I th and I think actually a lot of ways that archaeologists can contribute to saving the world. Uh, one of it is, you know, this is, I think, maybe the most obvious, but not everyone, I think, recognizes just how powerful it can be. So, you know, we need to learn from the past. 
and archaeologists are primed and we have through our particular sets of methods and our interpretations and the data we work with, we're in a powerful position to make those connections between past and present. So, for instance, my research in Rosewood is really geared towards showing how, you know, like historical racial violence on the one hand is part of a much broader set of cultural beliefs and practices that have certainly changed over the last century but we still have social inequality. And so making those connections, I think helps us understand uh, the roots of social inequality. And then of course, um, making those connections also like we're doing in Levy County brings members of different communities, in this case, maybe different racial communities or communities of different ethnic backgrounds uh, into closer conversation. And of course, that's, um, that's a big thing that our country still has to do deal with those questions of difference. And I think archaeologists are, um, I think we're powerfully positioned to do that, but I think we don't, as a discipline, necessarily recognize how powerfully positioned we are to do this. And then, you know, the other, I think one of the other big concerns we have is, you know, how, um, how the world's climate is changing. And regardless of what uh, one thinks may be the cause of this. We know that sea levels are rising. We know that things are changing. And so uh, archaeologists have tools that show how these things have changed, how they're hastening in some places. Um, and so not only in an interest of protecting our, our heritage and our history, which I think most people value sort of implicitly, uh, we can also look to the past and see how people dealt with these things in the past and hopefully get lessons for them in the future. So I mean, really sort of wherever you position yourself as an archeologist, I think we all have a really, um, I think we're really fortunate to be in a position to make those sorts of contributions. Oh, I absolutely love that. And I think you are absolutely right. One of the big things that archeologists study, I mean, we're studying human beings, but we're also studying these trends and these trends don't really change all too much. Their core values, things still keep kind of happening might be small little deviations, but we can look back and trace those trends back and see how they've progressed. And um, I think bringing these, uh, these trends are just showing how you know, the depth of time, this stuff has always happened, but here's how it changes. Here's how these small little moments in history have affected these trends and where we're going. I think that definitely plays into social uh, inequality and with climate change. Our last kind of wrap up question is just for fun, a little bit of entertainment in these trying times. But during our stay at home orders or quarantine or self-imposed social isolation, um, what is keeping you sane? Uh, well, stuff like this for one, right? Like um, reaching out and touching base, having um, virtual Hangouts, uh, that's a huge part of it. Um, you know, uh, I'm, a, I'm a teacher at the University of Central Florida, so doing this with students is, is helping. Uh, I'm hoping it's helping both ways. Uh, but also, uh, I'm playing a lot of video games. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, exploration games and, and that sort of stuff, just uh, finding, trying to find that mix of staying productive but also recognizing that um, maybe in some ways now more than ever, I need to be very um, conscious of the need to be, to take care of myself, to give myself downtime, right? Because I think a lot of us can be workaholics and there's no separation between home and work now. So if we're not being cognizant of that, then, you know, we face things like burnout and so forth. So um Maybe, maybe I'm overthinking and just trying to justify playing too many video games, but I think that's an important, very, I think that's crucial right now. All right. Well, I have to say thank you so much for joining me and tune in next time for our next episode of Tea and Trials. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.